Okay, so tonight, Be'ezra Sashem, we're going to be continuing with our series of Shirim on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And tonight, we're going to be learning, or looking at, or beginning to look at, the 52nd teaching, Torah Nun Beis, Torah Beis Nun. In Lekutim Aran Chelek Aleph, referred to as Hanei or Belayla, those who are awake at night, or the one who is awoke at night, now, like all previous weeks, this is a self-contained shear. The Torah itself is kolel mineyu bey, anything that needs to be understood in the Torah, with no need for recourse to other Torahs in Lukut Maharan, as we've introduced numerous times based on the Klalim of Rav Avram and Rav Nachman. Nevertheless, in this week's shear, we are going to deviate a little bit and enter into another Torah, at least. One more Torah in Lukut Amaran, that's going to be Torah Chaf, Chaf Hei in Lukut Amaran Tanyana, where he discusses, where the Tzaddik discusses the Indian Ha'as Bodidus. And I certainly didn't plan to discuss this teaching, and I'm certainly not one to take myself that seriously, but I came into my base Medrash last night and I saw that my Lukut Amaran was on the floor, Rahman al but it was open to Torah Chafhei in Lukut Amaran Chilak Beis, which is Inyan Ha'as Boydidus. And when looking at it, I realized that I needed to make recourse to that as well in order to fully understand in my humble reading Torah Nun Beis. Also, what's relatively new this week, although not new, is that in order for me to find the language, the, the tools, the kalim to be masbir this Inyan of Torah Nun Beis in a way that is matim to the way I maybe want to read the Torah or how I feel I should try and give over the Torah. We're also going to be utilizing, not inside at all, but anybody who wants to get a further understanding of the Torah can look in Rav Shagar's Perush on Torah Nun Beis in the second volume of Rav Shagar's Shirim on Lukutimaran. Torah Nun Beis is unique in the sense that it discusses in a not only theoretical way, but a spiritual way, the concept of, of Rabbi Nachman's, not chiddush, but the renewal of an old idea, which is referred to as hispodidus, solitude or prayer of solitude or aloneness or even loneliness on a certain level of understanding the word bedidut or badad. And it's not simply Rabbi Nachman giving the derech to his paidudus, offering us the tools of his paidudus, but it's Rabbi Nachman contextualizing the avoda of his paidudus, the avoda of praying to God in your own language, in your own space, beyond the typical normative forms of tefillah, and the minyan of shacharis, mincha, and mariv, or even tikkun chatzos, or even Tehillim, or Kinos, Hisbodidus is a different Indian altogether with regards to prayer. It's a prayer that is rooted in the individual in their aloneness, in their solitude, in the very essence of them being themselves with no recourse to anybody other than themselves. And it's well known that Rabbi Nachman took Hisbodidus and he placed it at the apex of his system. Rabbi Shemayim Morgenstern Shlita in Yam HaChachma, Tafshin Ayin Dalid, has a mimer that's about 200 pages long called Heim Am Levadad Yishkon. They are a nation that dwells unto themselves, again, playing on the word Levadad, of Bedidut, of alone, a certain solitude of the Jewish people. And the entire conversation there is about how his Hispoidudus is not simply a suggestion. It's not simply a mode of prayer. But as my very dear friend, as my Rebbe, Rav David Weinberg, points out in his new Sefer, it's the purpose of creation. Personal prayer is the purpose of creation. It's not simply a symptom of being a human being in the world. It's part of the purpose of being a human being in the world. And what Rabbi Nachman does in Tarun Nun Beis is he places the concept of his Hispoidudus, which is so often discussed as simply the greatness of it or a way to do it, but Rabbi Nachman places it within the ontological concept of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the world. So that his this is not simply a way of praying, but it's a way of abiding. It's a way of engaging with the 
tachlis haratzon that Hashem has for us in this world, which takes it from a simple psychological suggestion, lahavdil, and places it into an authoritative and fundamental mode of divine engagement, of, of reaching across the unbridgeable chasm that we've spoken about so often, that gesher tsar ma'oid ma'oid, that his us and the ability to be alone in this way is not only to pray for oneself, but it's an ability to connect to Hashem. Before giving over this Torah, Rabbi Nassim describes, and this is brought down in Chayim Maharan, this is also brought down in Koich Or, a sefer, beautiful sefer from Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman, in Oisir Aleph, describing how Rabbi Nassim came to Rabbi Nachman after trying to be mitbodeid, after trying to daven on his own, understanding the need to reach out to Hashem in a way that collective prayer wouldn't do. Also engaged in his own anxieties, lahavdil, his own overwhelmingness of what it meant to be on the spiritual path that Shvil Manatzad, that Rabbi Nachman opened up, and what it meant to be the, the small luminary, the moon that reflects the light of Rabbi Nachman, which reflects the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Rabbi Nassim came to his Rebbe, and they spoke about the Indian of his boy did us. And then Rabbi Nassim continues, and he says that when I heard these words from my tzaddik, when I heard these words from Rabbi Nachman, when I heard this interpretation, as we're going to see in the Torah, he was so overwhelmed. Me'oitzem mesikus hargashas maharanat from the depths of the pleasure and the engagement and the ecstatic excitement that Rabbi Nassim had when he heard these words, from these powerful ideas, it was simply the words themselves that took Rabbi Nassim and negated this worldliness for him. It took him out of this world. It elevated him to a place of supernal clarity of being okay with HaKadosh Baruch and with himself. V'yitzak bekolo v'yamar aha. And Rabbi Nassim says that he screams out, aha, this, this is what I've been waiting for my entire life. Aha, gewald, gewald to hear such things. Arutzana b'shvakim v'rachoyvais v'etzak aha. I'm going to run throughout the marketplace, I'm going to run throughout the streets, I'm going to run throughout the world, and I'm going to scream out, aha, I have found it. I have found what I've been searching for my whole life. I'm going to scream to other people, what are you doing? What are you wasting your time? What are you ignoring this deep truth that this tzaddik just revealed, the ability to be alone in your existential solitude and to connect to Hashem there? And from the great flames that emerged within Rabbi Nassim's heart, Ad Shemam Mishyatsam Megeder Anoishi to the point that it almost was as if he was no longer a human being. He was so overwhelmed by these words. Again, the words of Tyra Nun Beis. He honestly wanted to run out and start screaming this from the top of his lungs, start giving this etza of being alone with yourself and finding Hashem in that aloneness, in your solitude. Umiyad, and this is so, this is so gewalt. This is so Rabbi Nachman. Umiyar chataf oso ad morzal. Immediately, Rabbi Nachman saw this excitement, this overwhelming response to this Torah. And he grabs Rabbi Nachman by his beged. The anar v'amar lo amod. Stop. Be still. Be still. Kiloi tifal klal. Because it will have no impact on anybody. It won't do a single thing. So how does a person deal with this? How does a person understand the context of this Torah? Rabbi Nelson's almost ecstatic response to these ideas, feeling that the world needs to hear this secret of his boyditus. And Rabbi Nachman saying, stop, stop, calm down. You're not going to do a single thing. Even if you were to run around the world announcing this, it wouldn't change a single iota of one person's avoida. And honestly, I think the entire shir tonight is going to try and understand this strange story of how it could be that the Torah inflamed Rabbi Nassim in such a way 
And how it could be that Rabbi Nachman understood that if you were to try and share this Torah with another person, it won't do a single thing. Because I believe the secret of this Torah, the secret of Torah Nun Beis, the secret of the 52nd Torah in Lakuta Maran is the secret of solitude, is the secret of feeling as if one is alone in the world, is the secret of feeling as if one is the only individual that exists in relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Like we saw in Torah hey, that each person has to say to themselves that Bishvilin Ever Ha'olam. And as we see in between Lukut Maran Chelek Aleph and Lukut Maran Chelek Pez, Echad Haya Avraham. If a person wants to know how to enter into Avodah Hashem, there's a certain solipsistic holiness that needs to be cultivated. Wherein one recognizes that all that exists is me and God, nobody else. And in order to understand the secret of Hespoidatus, a person has to also understand that this Torah can set you aflame but at the same point, that natural, all too human tendency to want to share this with other people is not going to do anything. Because it's not about how other people respond. It's not about how other people take the teaching, but it's about what the teaching does for you. And if we can enter into the mindset, of what Rabbi Nassim was feeling and what Rabbi Nachman was trying to tell him, it's imaginable to claim that Rabbi Nassim wanted to share this Torah so desperately to take the teaching of rectifying solitude, of moving from loneliness and isolation into solitude, which is holy. And Rabbi Nachman was saying, no, if you want this teaching to work, it has to remain yours. It has to be within your heart because the whole secret of this Indian is how to be levado, how to be alone with oneself how to live in the nocturnal state of the world, in the lila, in the nighttime of the world, and to be okay being alone. Rabbi Nachman introduces this teaching with a remarkable chiluk, a chiluk that is based on the writings of the Rambam in Mar Nevuchim, in Hilchos Yisod Torah, where the Rambam, in argument with the Talmidim of Aristotle, states very explicitly that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Mechuyev HaMetzius. Hashem Kavyachol is an essential reality, not dependent on anything other than its own existence, not contingent. There's nothing that can add or detract from God's existence, but rather God's existence is predicated on nothing other than its existence. It needs no external support. It is mechuyev hametzius. There is nothing one can say or do that can affect its true reality. And this world, and us, and our personalities, and our anxieties, and all of our shtuyot, and all of our chasronot, and yisronot, and all the things that make us human, all of those are efsharei hametziyot. They're possible, they're inessential, they're contingent. Meaning to say, our existence is not essential, but rather it is a choice that God makes, so to speak, to create human beings, to create the world. And once we're created on a certain level, we exist. But our existence is not essential. And the end of our existence or the nullification of our existence wouldn't change any ontological status of the world but rather it would simply be something that happened that no longer happens. To be Afshari Hametzius, to be a possibility, to be contingent, to recognize that human beings and the world that we live in are not essential in their nature, but are rather dependent on external sources. And if those external sources fall away, then our existence falls away as well. And this very typical binary that the Rambam introduces and that Rabbi Nachman seems to be basing himself on is that God is essential. God exists no matter what, independent of any external or internal causes. But human beings in all of existence are contingent. They don't exist on an essential level, but rather they're inessential. They just happen to exist. And if they stopped existing, in any way that we can imagine such a thing, it wouldn't make too much of a difference with regards to the ontology of existence. Hashem would still remain in his howling solitude, as Rav Soloveitchik points out so often, independent of human beings. 
But Rabbi Nachman is not satisfied with this very clear distinction, which he admits is very true, that human beings are contingent and God is essential. But Rabbi Nachman wants to understand where does the idea come from? Where does the apikorsis come from? Where does the kfira come from? That states that this world is also mechuyev hametzios. Where does it come from? Where does the idea or the possibility come from that it emerges in the minds of the heretics, as the Rambam describes in Moranavuchim, that just as God is essential, so too this world and human beings are essential as well. And that we're not contingent. And that we're not dependent on factors outside of ourselves, but rather we exist in an essential ontological way that cannot be shaken that means something not only to us, but to the very cosmos of existence and the DNA of existence itself. Rabbi Nachman is interested in where such a ta'us can come from. How could it be that people make such a mistake to claim that not only is God essential, but human beings and the world are essential as well? Now, parenthetically, what's remarkable about this teaching is that in Torah Samach Dalet, for example, I believe... This is the Torah that we're going to be learning next week in Boy El Paro. Rabbi Nachman discusses different forms of apikorsis. And the question discerning the different types of apikorsis or the different forms of heresy is whether one should attempt to answer the heretics or whether one should remain silent in the face of the heretical question. So the discussion that Rabbi Nachman has there is whether it is permitted on an existential and almost halachic way to respond to the questions of the heretics. Here in Torah Nun Beis, Rabbi Nachman is not that careful. Not only is Rabbi Nachman allowing us to try and cultivate an answer to the heretics, but he wants us to ask the very question that the heretics themselves are asking. He wants us to enter into the mindset of the heretic, which claims that this world is also mechuyev hametzios. That just as God is essential, independent of anything else, so too human beings and our existence is essential, independent of anything else. And although Rabbi Nachman states at the outset that this is an apikorsis it's an her- and a heresy, Rabbi Nachman wants to let us in on the origin of this heresy. Now, before we enter into the next stage of this teaching, of how it could be that there could be such a mistake in the world that perceives human beings as being essential and not contingent, we have to understand a little bit of what it means to be efshari hametzios, what it means to live in a state of possibility, of contingency. To be contingent, to be dependent, to live with an ahava shetuluya bedavar, a love that is dependent on something outside of ourselves, is to state that each and every one of our experiences, bein bechlal bein befrat, on a general level as well as an individualized level, are just happenings. They're not rooted in any essential truth. They're not connected to the source of all life, but rather they are things that just happen in the world. So that when you find yourself in a difficult situation, or a positive situation, it's almost as if a person should say to themselves, things are good right now just because they happen to be good, or things are bad right now just because they happen to be bad. And I simply have to wait until the laws of reality change and shift so that my circumstances change. But there's nothing essential, nothing inherent within my experience. No true nakuda of MS that I can find within my experiences because it's all contingent, it's all just happenstance, it's all dependent on external sources. To live with the mindset of contingency is to be cut through this way and that way with anxiety. The anxiety that says perhaps in spite of the fact that things are good right now, things can change very quickly to things being bad. Or in spite of the fact that you feel good about yourself right now or you feel connected with yourself right now, that's simply because the stars have aligned in such a way to give you that feeling, but there's no truth at the core of that feeling. You can't rely on that feeling. 
You can't draw real comfort from that feeling because ultimately that feeling is happenstance and it's not rooted in the deep capital T truth of Emes La Amiso of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And so to be a contingent being means to live in a constant state of the anxiety about whether things will shift or whether things will change. And it cuts a person through with doubts as to whether we can actually truly believe that where I am in this moment is significant. Because contingency dictates that perhaps it's insignificant. Perhaps it's meaningless. To live with that sense of contingency is to live with that frightening announcement of the profane prophets who state that existence precedes essence. That this world and its randomness simply exists and all we do as human beings is apply secondary and inessential meaning to this world. But our meaning and our reasoning never touches the core of anything. So to be a contingent being, to live within Efshare HaMetzius, is to live cut through with that anxiety, that doubt, that potential of Yeyush, that possibility of hopelessness. So Rabbi Nachman comes back to the question, he says, where does it come from? Where does it come from, the idea that even human beings are mechuy of hametzius, that even human beings are essential, that they're not contingent? Where does this heresy come from? So here Rabbi Nachman is basing himself on the mekubalim, kedar chabakodesh, speaking in and through and sometimes beyond them. Now, the idea that we're going to describe right now is certainly clear in the Shirim on the Leshem, on the Shirim on Rav Kook, on the Shirim on Ishbitz, because it's very similar to the teachings of Rabbeinu Azriel of Geroina, as well as the teachings of Mahari Sarug, the Kabbalah of Rabbi Yisrael Sarug and the Olam HaMalbush, as well as the Arizal and Shar Membez and Eitzchayim and Shar Aleph and Eitzchayim. And this is what Rabbi Nachman says. He says, prior to the creation of the world, before God decides to create the world, prior to that moment of before that autogenesis of that desire to create the other emerged within the mind of God, so to speak. You're right. The world is Efshare HaMetzius. The world is contingent. The world is simply a possibility. It doesn't exist yet. It doesn't have to exist. God doesn't lose anything if it doesn't exist. Kav Yachol doesn't. God doesn't gain anything if it does exist. Kav Yachol. There's no need. There's no essentiality to existence. But after the creation of the world, after HaKadosh Baruch Hu has decided to create the world and the Jewish people within it, and Yisrael, Allah bin Machshava Kaduma, that the Torah and Tefillah and Emunah and the Jewish people and the process of the Lev HaOlam throughout history is the birth and the origin of the creation of the world. Once Hashem decides to create the world, at that point it's Mechuyav HaMetzius. At that point the world is necessary. At that point, the world takes on essential contours. At that point, the existence of the world with the Jewish people in it and the mitzvot and the Torah and the Amuna that we have makes it as if we need to exist. And that Hashem Kav Yachol, cannot do it without us existing. Now, before we move further into the Lashon of the Arizal, Baruch Hashem for Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman, in Bir Halikutim, in a very few lines, it's a very short Bir Halikutim, he states that this concept that Rabbi Nachman is describing is exactly what we've been discussing since two years ago, since we began teaching Torah, which is that in order for the infinite to be truly infinite, it has to have the capacity to manifest itself in finitude. Something that we saw in the Shirim of Ravichemeyer Morgenstern, and in the Shirim of the Leshem, based on the writings of Rabbeinu Azriel of Gerona, that the Koyach had built the Gvul, that the power of infinity needs to be able to manifest itself in finitude. Because if you detract the capacity of imperfection from the perfect, what you do is then negate the capacity of perfection to express itself through imperfection. And therefore, says Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman, what Rabbi Nachman is describing here is very simple. 
that prior to the expression of the lack of the world, prior to the expression of the Koyach HaGvul, of the deficiency of existence, of human beings, of our experience, there was no necessity for God to create the world. We don't add or detract from God's infinity. But once that Koyach HaGvul, once that power of limitation is expressed, from potential into actualization, so then it's on a certain level, again, with the prerequisite of kavyachol, so to speak, it's fundamental to realize that in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to be truly infinite, existence and the Jewish people need to exist as well. That we are the koyach HaGvul, we are the capacity of the imperfection within the perfection of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Nabi Nachman says that you're right. Before the creation of the world, the world is Efshari Hamitsius. The world is contingent. And with that contingency comes all those senses of anxiety and doubt and the possibility of Yeyush. And the possibility that the moment that I'm sitting in right now doesn't mean anything. Or that the words that we say to comfort ourselves are simply psychological in nature and not chas v'shalom ontological, God forbid. The world existed, but Afshari HaMetzius, it was only a possibility. It wasn't essential. But once Hashem decided to reveal the Koyach HaGvul, once God, so to speak, decided to reveal himself in the manner that he revealed himself, then it becomes an essential part of reality. And then what we experience in this world our experience on a day-to-day level, on a historical level, in our own particular hearts, with all of our difficulties and all of our successes, transition from being possible, contingent, and doubtful and anxiety-producing, to being essential. That once Hashem has created us, once we find ourselves thrown into this world, in this moment of awareness, Be'es hazos, in any moment that a person is aware, it becomes fundamental to our belief that we are essential, that we exist for a purpose, that we exist on the level of mechuyev hametzius, of an essential creation. And Rabbi Nachman says that because for the Jewish people, once we're created, we become essential, we're no longer contingent. For that reason, the apicorsis of the world makes the mistake and says that the entirety of existence is independent, is mechuyev hametzius, is essential. Rabbi Nachman says that this mistake emerges from the fact that on a certain level, it's very true for the Jewish individual, for the individual who seeks Hashem out that as we exist in the moment that we exist is truly essential. Which means to say, Rabbi Nachman is asking a very simple question. How can one draw the certitude and the essentiality and the power and the essence of mechuyev hametzius, of the sense of being essential, that it cannot be any other way than it is right now, How do we draw that confidence, that comfort, that power into the shaky ground of Efshari HaMetzius? How does one draw down the light of being essential into the kli of being contingent? How does one draw down the light of certainty into the experience of doubt? How does one draw down the sense that wherever I am, whatever I am doing is exactly what I need to be doing at this very moment? Into the sense that perhaps what I'm doing is insignificant and meaningless. And this is what Rabbi Nachman is coming to teach us. That on a certain level, the Jewish people exist, the seekers of God exist on a level of essentiality with the recognition that whatever I am doing at this moment cannot be any different than the way it is. And there is a deep truth that abides within each and every moment that I find myself in. A truth that is 
not dependent on external circumstances, but independent because it represents the true essence of existence. It gives me access to Hashem, which means that it transforms that psychological comfort that comes from being convinced to think a certain way and it transforms into a true sense of being okay because when I take a deep breath, I am truly okay and the belief is that I am with Hashem at this moment. And Rabbi Nachman asks the question of how is it or what do we need to do in order to change our perspective? How do we move? How do we move from the contingency, the afshare hamitsius, the doubt and the anxiety of being contingent, and move towards mechuyev hamitsius, to the sense that everything that I am doing is essential, and that my experience at this moment cannot be different than what it is without uprooting the entirety of the creation that Hashem has created? How could it be that I can find the possibility of living in this moment with a deep power of recognizing that everything I need is found right now. And Rabbi Nachman answers that the answer is through bittel, is through self-negation, is through learning how to think less about ourselves, is through learning how to be less obsessed with ourselves, less absorbed within ourselves. Now, it's very important to understand that Bittl doesn't mean, at least from my understanding, any type of mystical negation, wherein the individual loses sense of their individual subjectivity in the face of the annihilating, transcendent, oceanic sense of Hashem. But bittel means the ability to think and be obsessed just slightly less than myself. To stop being so anxious with my own thoughts, with my own concerns, with my own fears, with my own insecurities, with my own chesronos, with my own obsessions and to move just slightly further into a space of believing in something greater than myself, in recognizing that I am not the sum total of existence, that my feelings do not dictate the reality of the world, but rather there is something more powerful, more encompassing, more light, more annihilating, more animating than my own individual egoism or egocentric subjectivity. That's what bittel means. Bittel means the ability for the human being to stop thinking that we are the center of the universe, that the way I think is what dictates reality. Rabbi Nachman then goes on to say, how do we engage in this bittel? How do we engage in this movement away from self-obsession, this willingness to surrender ourselves to the flow or to abide with a sense of acceptance or to be present in the moment itself without projecting my anxieties into the future or retrojecting my depressions into the past? How can I live in the moment free from the subjective chains that enslave me? from the mental slavery that I live in? Rabbi Nachman's answer is his boidudus, to be alone with Hashem. You want to understand how to begin to look at your life as mechuyev hametzius, as if every moment were essential and every moment were real, and that every moment offers a path a shvil menatzad or a gesher tsar ma'od ma'od towards light and kedusha and yishav hadas. Learn how to be alone. Learn how to recognize that you are okay just with Hashem. This is boidudus, this ability to daven to Hashem alone, is not necessarily the same type of davening that we typically engage in. 
it's not asking God to change the circumstances of one's life. It's not asking Hashem to take me out of the discomfort that I find myself in. His boidudus is coming to Hashem as one is, showing oneself vulnerably and unconditionally to Hashem with all of our blemishes, with all of our deficiencies, with all of our anxieties, with all of our tzabrachin kait, and all of our strengths and all of our confidences and all of the good things in our lives as well. His boidudus is the willingness to be present in the face of Hashem, to say, Hineni, here I am without asking for anything to be changed, but I am simply going to tell you, Kav Yachol, what my day has been like. As Rabbi Nachman says so often, his boidudus is the ability to speak to God, so to speak, as if one is speaking to a friend. One doesn't necessarily speak to a friend in the hopes that the friend can change them. One speaks to a friend in the hopes that the friend will be able to accept them as they are. If we can learn to be mitbodeid, if we can learn to take our solitude, that fear of being alone as a human being, and bring it to Hashem, and bring it into the conversation with God, then we bring our whole selves into the relationship. We're no longer asking Hashem to change our circumstances or to change how we feel or to change what's happening with us. But rather, we're bringing ourselves wholly in front of God and saying, here I am. I am prepared to be as I am in this moment. In my bedidus, in my loneliness, in my isolation, in the deep recognition that no matter how close I can come to people in this world, ultimately the chasm that separates my heart from another individual's heart is infinite in its infinitesimal distance. And that the only recourse that I have to true essential communication is when I turn to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That act of his spoidudus, that act that says, as I am in this moment is enough, that is what allows us to stop thinking about ourselves so much. We stop projecting our desires and our needs onto God. We stop demanding from God that he create a world or an experience which is matim to what we feel we need. But rather we say to Hashem, as I am with the circumstances that you have created me with, here I am in front of you, not asking to be changed not asking to be fixed, but carrying my broken bones, presenting myself unflinchingly in your face. That is the root of his poididus. That is how we take the bedidus, the badad, that loneliness, that human isolation, that fear, that existential fear of being alone. And we bring it in front of Hashem and we say, as I am in this moment is okay. Rabbi Nachman says that that is the path towards being a chi of hametzius, of recognizing that everything that I experience, everything that I live in this world is essential, is part of the process that you want me to go through. The equation is simple. If you want to learn how to live a life of mechuy of hametzius, if you want to learn how to live a life that takes you out of the anxiety of contingency, out of the anxiety and the inessential state of being inessential and being contingent, then one must accept the moments that they find themselves in unconditionally. One must live the moment that they are in to serve Hashem where they are at, not to ask for something else not to ask for someone else's brain or someone else's heart or someone else's hands or someone else's circumstances or someone else's desire, but rather to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu through our own mind and our own heart and our own hands and our own desire and to recognize that as I am is the way I am meant to be, to stop projecting my own desires onto God, but rather to live the reality of my life as the desire of God that I am not something that hasn't become yet. I am something that is truly present in the moment. 
And Rabbi Nachman says the only way to do this, the only possibility, the only hope of his boidudus, of bittel, is to separate oneself from the noise of the world, from the light of the world, from the light pollution of the world that pushes darkness away from us, from the noise of the world which deafens us to the silence of the self. Rabbi Nachman says that in order to be mitbodeid, a person has to find solitude. A person has to quite literally and figuratively separate themselves from the masses, find a quiet space. Find a space where you're no longer threatened by the they. You're no longer bothered by what someone else thinks of you or what someone else might want from you or what you think someone else might want from you, but rather you are capable of being present to yourself in that moment. Because when a person is alone, they come to realize that the only source of comfort is Hashem. The only true source of comfort is God. It's not in other people. It's not in civilization. It's not in culture. It's not in the superego. It is in the self that connects to God. And so Rabbi Nachman says a person has to depart away from the waking world, away from the noise and the pollution and the projections that invade our minds at all times, away from the light of day which fills us with the hope that maybe I can change myself, maybe I can be better in this way, maybe I could do this more, but rather to accept oneself in the darkness of the self, to accept oneself with all of one's blemishes, in all of one's essential solitude. Because when a person is capable of accepting themselves as they are in that moment, what we're saying to Hashem is that I don't need anything else. I'm no longer contingent. As I am in this moment is okay. And this is what Rabbi Nachman says throughout this entire Torah. Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman this is brought down in the Hakdama to Biur Halikutim, as well as the biographies written on him. He used to travel to a forest on the outskirts of Uman to be mitbodeid. And he said to his Hasidim that I'm specifically going to this dark forest, the forest where the Koycha Tzachitzoinim, where the strengths of the external forces of the world are alive. A frightening forest, a terrifying forest, an anxiety-producing forest. And as, when his Hasidim asked him why, he said, because that's where I can learn to cry. That's where I can learn to cry tears. And they said, why do you want to learn how to cry? And he says, because every Torah that I've given to you is written in my own tears. The Torah that one offers to another individual are the tears of self-acceptance, are the bechia of being present to God in the solitude of the self without any recourse to the desires or the dreams or the fantasies of anybody else, but to truly present oneself in an essential solitude with the deep realization that I am the only one in the face of HaKadosh Baruch Hu right now. Echad Haya Avraham. And to end, what I want to do is look at the teaching that Rabbi Nachman brings down, because it's a giloy. The teaching that Rabbi Nachman begins this teaching with and ends this teaching with is not something, in my humble opinion, that the human mind is capable of grasping, but it is a gift that emerges from above. The essential nature of this teaching, the power of this teaching is so strong that it's almost impossible to conceive of the fact that Rabbi Nachman would have thought of this on his own, that even at Tzaddik like Rabbi Nachman, this is a gift from above. Rabbi Nachman starts off with the mission in Avos in Parak Gimel. Rabbi Chanina ben Chania Yomer. Rabbi Chanina says, Haneur Balayla, someone who is awake at night, and they walk on the path of solitude alone, and they allow their hearts to contemplate and perceive meaningless things. A person like this is chayev. A person like this is liable for their soul. The Mishnah is clearly stating something negative. That if you walk around at night on a path on your own, contemplating meaningless matters, so then you cause a danger to yourself. But based on everything we have learned until now, this is what Rabbi Nassim says in the name of Rabbi Nachman. The Atta Tire Pile Plos, 
And now you, you will perceive wonders of wonders. How all of this is expressed explicitly in the Mishnah. Vizehu, Haneor Balaila, someone who is awake at night, Kipshuto, Dahainu Shehu Neor Balaila, someone who keeps themselves awake at night, in the darkness of the world, when the lights of the world no longer show me the faces of other people, but the nocturnal state reminds me that I can only know myself. And somebody who is awake at night talking to Hashem, expressing what's going on in our own heart of hearts with Hashem, not desiring to change it, but simply reporting the news like we would report to a friend. Like the Mishnah says, and someone who walks on the path of solitude. As we've said, that they see themselves as in a state of solitude, disconnected from any other person, no longer in the need of other people's approvals or disapproval of my behavior. In a place where no one else can be found. Because that is the essential state of being alone. Daika, like we've said so often, specifically there, in the nocturnal state of solitude. Ki az daika yechoylim lavo lebechinas bittel. Because it's specifically there that a person can learn to think about themselves a little bit less. To recognize that my thoughts are not what dictates reality. To recognize that it is simply a Kaddish Baruch Hu who runs the world. Ki az daika yechoylim lavo lebechinas bittel. And this is what the Mishnah says when it says, someone who turns their hearts to insignificant matters. Someone who is able to clear their hearts out of all of the activities and the engagement of this world. Somebody who is able to say to themselves that my thoughts and my concerns and my anxieties are not what determine the reality of existence but rather there is a source that is higher than it. There is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The Azai, and at that point, Nechlalim, we contain ourselves and all of the worlds and our souls within the Chi of HaMetzias, within Hashem. And this is what the Mishnah means when it says, HaRezeh Metchayev Benafsho. You have turned your soul from something contingent into something essential. You have made your existence something essential. Every moment that you exist is real. Every feeling that you have is real. You no longer have to try and change it. You simply bring it to Hashem. Because you have included yourself and the entire world within the Chiyuv HaMetzius, within the essential nature of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. What Rabbi Nachman is saying here is that if we want to learn we want to understand how to see every moment of our lives as essential, as carrying an essential message, which quiets that perpetual voice that says, perhaps I need to be elsewhere. Perhaps I need to be doing something else. Perhaps I should be putting my efforts elsewhere. If a person wants to live with the sense that we're no longer contingent, that we're essential, we don't have to be anxious. We can find comfort and rest and amuna wherever we are. It's only through the act of learning how to be alone, learning how to be alone at night, no longer seeing the faces of the others, but truly recognizing that as I am in this moment contains within itself all possibilities, contains within itself whatever it needs. Rav Avram ben Rav Nachman in his footnotes in Koich Ve'or, says something remarkable. He says, why is it that Rabbi Nassim got so excited about this teaching? Why is it that Rabbi Nassim got so overwhelmed with the sense that he needed to go out there and spread this teaching to the world? And Rav Avram Rachman writes as follows. He says that this teaching is the purest example where the teaching itself conveys the essence of the teaching that hearing these words themselves from Rabbi Nachman, not living them, not experiencing them in any existential or experiential way, but simply hearing them, 
contained the secret spiritual message that they needed to convey. Like we spoke about in the third shear, that reading the words themselves provides us with the comfort. Rabbi Nachman is teaching us in our own way how to find comfort within ourselves, in the darkness of night, when we can't see the light of day, when we're no longer overwhelmed or comforted by the faces of others. That is where we can accept ourselves. And by accepting ourselves and our circumstances, we come to believe that our circumstances are essential. They're part of mechuyev hametzius. And when they become part of mechuyev hametzius, they move out of the contingency of anxiety. And they tell us that every moment that we find ourselves in contains a spark that we need to elevate, a moment that we need to engage in. And to end with where we began, this could be why, even though Rabbi Nassim was so excited about this teaching, when it came time for him to spread it to the rest of the world to run through the streets, Rabbi Nachman understood that it won't change a single thing. Because the goal of a teaching like this is to allow it to penetrate into the depths of the depths of the self. To remind oneself in their solitude itself that I am enough, that my relationship with Hashem is enough, that where I am at this present moment is enough. But Ezra Sashem, next week, we're going to enter into teaching Samach Dalid of Boyel Paro, the paradox of something and nothing, which is simply going to be, once again, Rabbi Nachman teaching us how to cross over that Gesher Tsar Ma'od Ma'od, how to bridge the unbridgeable with an invisible bridge that is very delicate and very thin. And Be'ezra Sashem, we're going to have success. We're going to enter in and try and teach the teaching in a way that will be mityashev al-levavos b'nei adam.